Greetings. Today, I'm going to give a detailed exposition of a technique that I call the scriptorium, named after the room where medieval monks would sit and transcribe manuscripts. This is a writing technique that any language learner who's interested in this kind of thing might find valuable. This is also a technique that polyglots in particular can find very useful to develop a maintenance routine for their many languages. And finally, it's a technique that polyliterate students can use to create transcribed manuscripts of their own. So I'll discuss this in, in that order. I have two fundamental techniques that I have used in my life as an autodidact. Uh, I learned most of my languages uh, in college by in graduate school by just doing what I needed to do in the class. But once I got out of school and I began teaching myself languages, I began looking for the most effective, uh, most efficacious the means and techniques that I could use, and I swiftly gravitated towards two. And these are the two techniques that back in 2009, 13 years ago, when I first started sharing information about my experience as a, as a language lover, learner, um, on YouTube, I made a first video on shadowing, the technique that now I've made <clears throat> about four or five more videos about just over the past month. Uh, and this is a technique that focuses on listening and repeating simultaneously. So it's a speaking technique. It develops your listening. Um, you can do it while looking at a text. Uh, so you can develop your reading ability too while you're looking at it. Um, you can learn to really, when you listen to authentic native speakers who are doing it in a talented fashion, you can learn to imitate their voice. You can learn to narrate a, a good a classic text with this as well, but it's fundamentally a speaking technique. And then there's the technique that I'm talking about today, scriptorium. You see the word script in there. This is obviously a writing technique. <clears throat> and this is something that focuses on writing. You have to read what you're writing before you write it down. Um, you need to be very aware of all the details in what you're writing and you're kind of analyzing as you go. So given those two descriptions, um, I'm not at all surprised that shadowing has uh, aroused more interest, uh, caught more people's attention, more people have been using it uh, over the years, over as time's gone by. Um, but I, as I said, I'm not surprised about that, but I'm, I am flabbergasted the degree to which that is the case, at least here on YouTube, which is again, where I unleash these two things and shadowing uh, since then has generated, um, if you look on YouTube videos about shadowing, I, haven't actually counted them. It seems like there are scores and scores, maybe hundreds of them. People talking about how they use it, how they've uh, made variations on it, or how they criticize it, all, all different kinds of things, but there are lots of them. And compared to that, Scriptorium, there's exactly one other video that's ever been made about the Scriptorium, and that's quite recently by uh, a young woman <clears throat> who, uh, as far as I can tell, is uh, not a polyglot want to be. She's just uh, an American kid who is so serious about learning Japanese that she's gone there and is studying it in a university and is looking for all the techniques that she can find to um, to really study this in, 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 in a hardcore serious fashion. And so uh, she made this video about a year ago uh, about how she has employed Scriptorium and validates it and, and I appreciate that. And I'm gonna talk now about how, um, what I would call normal language learners, just people who are wanting to find a good technique to learn any language have uh, employed this. But I think that uh, if you're interested in that in particular, have a look at her video because she goes into great depth about uh, in detail about what she did and how she used it. <clears throat> so what, what is scriptorium? Scriptorium is a technique where you need a text to look at. So you take a text and you start out by reading it aloud. You should aim to read a whole sentence. If it's too long, too hard, you can read a, a fragment of a sentence. You read something aloud. And then right after you've read it aloud, you write it down. You write it down and you say each sound as you are writing that sound. So syllable by syllable, word by word, uh, you write it down. Once you've written down what you have read aloud, you then read aloud everything that you wrote. So if you wrote a sentence, you read the whole sentence, just as you wrote it down. As you're going along, you should be checking, making sure you don't make mistakes, check for errors, check for things that you don't understand. If there's a word you don't understand, a form you don't understand, um, you need to note that down. 
And depending on your style of doing this, um, you can stop and look it up in a grammar book right now, or you can make note of it uh, and go along and do it. But you want to check for errors and points that you don't understand as you go along. Uh, you want to then do it over again. You want to do this. You should have a target. You should set X here is, is could be 10 minutes, could be 20 minutes, could be 30 minutes. Um, you want to set a target time that you're going to do this, but you need to stop before that time if you find that you're not focused. This exercise has no value. There's no point in doing it uh, if you are not 100% focused on it. And when you're done for the day, if you manage, if you set 15 minutes as your goal and you got to 15 minutes or whatever you've done, you end and you read everything that you just wrote down. You read it all aloud from your own handwriting. And then the next day, when you come back, this should be a daily practice, um, the next day you begin uh, by reading what you wrote down the day before. So that's the, the essence of what Scriptorium is. And to show what it looks like, I have made a video of me writing uh, just one sentence, and you'll see how detailed and, and long that one sentence can be. So I will read this from the screen. In principio erat verbum, et verbum erat apud deum, et deus erat verbum. Now I will write that. In principio erat verbum, et verbum erat apud de um et de us erat where boom in principio erat verbum et verbum erat apud de um et de us erat where boom so you see for the purpose of the demonstration, I'm just doing one sentence, but I've got a whole paragraph there. I could have a whole page, uh, and I would go along like that and noting things down as I went. So what should you know about Scriptorium, how to do it properly? You must, as I said, be focused. You must be aware. You must pay attention to detail. You're doing conscious analysis here. Uh, this requires deep concentration. I can hear skeptics just watching this saying, you're just, you're just copying. No, this is not just copying. It, it risks that if you don't have this kind of focus. But when you are totally focused and aware, um, you, this requires great, great consciousness in order to do it. Um, you need focus. That's a good thing. But a side effect of this is this it will help you develop focus. If it's hard for you to focus at first, if you do this exercise, um, you will be able to do this exercise better, and I think you'll find that your focus in other areas carries over. So it's a good way of training your focus, if, if nothing else. Um, the purpose of Scriptorium is to make yourself slow down. You need to pay attention to aspects of formal grammar and syntax, vocabulary, and things like that. So if that speaks to you, this might be a good exercise for you. If that turns you off, if you if you have no desire to do that but just to speak, then this is not a practice that uh, you should engage in. Uh, you will not enjoy it. You won't profit from it. But if you're interested in that, if you want to know details, if you want to know how things work and fit together, um, this kind of slow attention to detail and noticing of everything is a great way to develop that. You have to do this writing by hand. Uh, I'm not the only person out there that has done has, has this conviction that writing things by hand somehow develops a connection between what you do and, and your brain that cannot be uh, attained by, by typing or by texting or by other forms of, of writing. And above all, writing by hand, as you just saw in the video, is rather slow. It makes you slow down and pay attention uh, rather than zipping through things. Because that's a danger with the scriptorium. Um, it can be easy to not do it with proper form. It's, there's always a temptation to try to get it done faster. So there's a temptation to rush through it. There's a temptation to do it silently, not reading aloud. Uh, and then you get careless. And if you do these things, then it will become just copying. And it's really not of, of, of very much value. No, not nearly as much value as it, as it could be if you had that kind of focus and awareness and attention. As I said, you should always be checking for mistakes. 
make sure you didn't make them. So I saw in the video that I just made, uh, I would be looking in terms of calligraphy at this word. It's, it's, it's Latin and it's just, it's just a, uh, the form of a letter, but in Chinese or something, it could be very significant. The, the capital V has a little hook at the top. I put it in the first two, but I didn't put it in the third one. If I were really emulating this, I would need to go back and check that. Um, there's grammar in there. Um, there's things, there could be words in there that I don't know. Uh, so as I mentioned before, you can do this depending on you, on your style. If you've got a grammar book and a dictionary right there, you might want to stop and look things up right away and get that clarity. Um, you might somehow want to put a star or an asterisk or write it down separately and uh, look at everything afterwards. Um, and you might have access to a teacher or a tutor whom you could ask, say, here's a list. Here's all sorts of things that I noticed and I, I want to understand these. I want to know why this is this way. Um, I see there's an accent on this word sometimes and not other times. It ends in this word form sometimes. It ends in that form another time. Why? Why is it spelled this way sometimes? Why is it spelled that way? This is the kind of thing that you want to make sure that you understand. Um, as I just said, the goal uh, with Scriptorium is to make sure that you always understand completely everything you're writing. This is a time when you want absolute clarity and understanding and in-depth analysis of, of how things work. This will be done differently depending on the level that you are as a language learner. As a language learner, you can always use your textbook if you've got a good textbook, if you've got a good manual like Asimil or Linguaphone. Um, particularly when you get more advanced, you can use supplementary materials, uh, native speaking books or, or journals or, or things like that. Um, this is not really intended for beginning language students. If this appeals to you and you're a beginning language student and you want to try it, you can get benefit from it, certainly. Um, you might want to do an extra step of either aloud to yourself or silently in your head, at least when you read something, check the translation to make sure you understand it there because you are just a beginner. You don't have uh, many things to, to notice that would need clarity right now, but you need to make sure that you understand uh, what you're saying. Um, this is better for intermediate students. Um, this is the level at which you would probably have a lot of those questions, like the ones that I just enunciated. Why are the use of accents, the spelling, the, the, the form changes of, of words? Um, uh, you probably notice that you make mistakes and you don't want to make them. This is a good way to refine them, polish them, get, get rid of them. Um, so this is very good for intermediate students. And for advanced students, it's, it's very good too. Um, you might find once you're advanced and maybe you've polished and gotten rid of a lot of uh, polished your, 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 your syntax and you don't make so many mistakes, but you'd like to write a little bit better. Well, if you're copying good style and good sentences and uh, you're doing this regularly, um, you're probably going to develop an ability to write better on your own. So this is a good way to develop that. I would recommend that if you're going to do this exercise, and again, it's not for all styles of language learners, but if this appeals to you, um, set a goal. Set a goal of working for 15 minutes and then maybe up to 20, 25, 30. Increase it as long as that's possible and profitable, as long as you can focus and concentrate on it. But as I said before, um, that awareness and focus are crucial. So if you are get interrupted and you can't focus anymore, it's better to stop than to try to plow on to repeat, to, to complete um, your allocated time because you won't be getting the value from it that you should. So that's for um, anybody who wants to use this to learn a language. Now, how about for polyglots? Polyglots can use this to do something that I call tending the garden, making an analogy. Um, I'm gonna venture out on a limb and speak for all polyglots. We have a problem when we're aspiring to become polyglots, we think it'd be wonderful to know so many languages. And then one day we turn around and we do know so many languages and we go, oh my God, how can I maintain them all? How can I use them all? How can I, I'm, I'm doing this one now and that one is rusting, I'm forgetting it. I, I spent so much time learning this language and now I never get to use it. It's a shame I'm gonna forget it. Um, we need to develop some sort of maintenance schedule, maintenance routine to keep everything in order, to keep it from rusting and and and, and not to have it be a waste of, of time that we put into it. So I like the analogy of thinking of each language as, as a plant or a flower that you might have in a garden. And every day you could go out into the garden and you could give everybody some water. If somebody's not getting enough sun or too much sun, you move them aside. If there's aphids or other insects on it, uh, you, you get rid of those. Everything needs trimming. So you give a little bit of attention to, to everything. And this is what you can do 
with Scriptorium as a polyglot with large numbers of languages. It's really a good uh, daily maintenance routine that can give you uh, at least some attention, like I just described, walking through your garden, uh, to many or most of your languages every day. This is because at this level, um, even five minutes a day is enough for that. Five minutes a day can be effective to maintain your languages if you do it on a, on a regular, consistent basis. Obviously, more is better, but if you have just this amount, uh, it, it can work pretty well. So um, I would recommend that you do it this way. Take the number of languages that you know and the amount of time that you can devote to this and do some calculations. I've got some up on the screen. I'll give some others. I mean, let's say you have 10 languages and you're going to do this for an hour. Then you could do each language for six minutes. Or if you've got only three languages and you've got 45 minutes, then you could give a whole 15 minutes to each. Whatever your um, amount of time that you have to devote to each language at this level, uh, I would recommend that you get a sports stopwatch like this, and you're going to take your stopwatch and you're going to set that for 30 seconds shorter than the amount of time that you have. So if you have, uh, you're working in five minute time blocks, you set this for four minutes and 30 seconds. You set this, uh, if you're working for uh, seven and a half minutes, you set this for seven minutes, and then you start writing. And when the beeper goes off, you may have just finished something. You may just be starting something. You may be in the middle, so it'll average out in the end. You finish off what you're doing, and then you move on to the next language. And I say move on to the next language because for the next point, I, I really think that this, for polyglots, just like at the Polyglot Conference, it's enjoyable to meet and use lots of languages all at once. This is more fun. This is more profitable. It's more interesting to see languages back to back. So I think this is better if you do it all at once. Um, but um, if that doesn't appeal to you, if that confuses you, or if your time schedule doesn't work out this way, you can also uh, chunk it throughout the day. Do a little bit here, you know, go back and, and do one, one language every hour throughout the day, however it appeals to you. Divide it up that way. Um, sometimes, if you work at it long and hard enough, you might have too many languages. You might have 20 languages or 30 languages, and you still only got an hour a day to work on this. Um, in that case, then what you can do, and it's almost as efficacious, say you have 20 languages in one hour. Um, that would be too little to try to do them all in one day. You put 10 on one day and 10 on the other day. So you have day A, day B. You have 10 languages for day A. You can do five, six minutes each, and then on day B, the other. So you alternate between them, and that's almost as good for maintaining them. Um, it's also efficacious if maybe you don't get to them all. You get interrupted and you can't go through them all. So um, if you can just cycle through them, you put your languages in order, all 20 in order, and you do them one for 20, and then you go back again, you cycle through them. Um, that's also effective. So in the first case, you're doing each language every day. In the second case, you're doing every other day. In this case, maybe two, three times a week. Um, that's not very much, but without a maintenance routine, you will probably find that you go months or years without looking at some languages, which again is a shame because you learn them because you love them and you'd like to spend time with them. So this is a way that you can end up doing that. Um, I think that you can, uh, if you learn languages from Asimil or Linguaphone type manuals that really take a good substantive chunk of the language and thoroughly give it to you and internalize it, if, if you can take that and over time truly 100% master it, internalize it, memorize it, make it part of you, uh, I think that's a good way to permanently um, learn a language and Scriptorium is a technique that can help you do that over time. So that's a good candidate to do with this. It's also very good to do Scriptorium with grammar books um, that have re reference grammars that have sections of sentences that all illustrate the same points. So um, that's a very good way to do Scriptorium too with, with reference grammars. Um, and I would just throw out that you might uh, be content doing this on scrap paper or in a spiral notebook, but uh, if you're going to be working on something like this every day, um, it's a nice record of your progress in what you've done if you 
keep it in a nice fashion. So if you're going to do this, consider getting a nice journal book, a nice bound journal, uh, and doing it with care and keeping uh, a record. I think you'll get more satisfaction out of it if you do it in this way. And that's a good segue to Scriptorium for Polyliteracy. Um, again, it's for, for polyglots I throw out that if you want a maintenance routine, you might want to consider doing this. If you're interested in polyliteracy, I'll say more forcefully, you need to put this on your event horizon. This is something that you should be doing or should aspire to do or should have a plan to do at the point in the future when you, when you get advanced enough. I consider scriptorium to be an essential core practice of, of polyliteracy. Um, it's something that if you're into the concept of the idea of being polyliterate, like I put it forth, this is something that you should be doing for at least an hour a day every day, 60 minutes a minimum. Um, and it's best if you can do this at one stretch uh, in one time block, uh, ideally early in the morning. And I say that for a number of reasons. Um, it sets the tone for your day. If this is an important thing for you to be doing, if you get something like this accomplished first thing in the morning, that sets the tone for the day. And then if this is a major, anything that's of major importance to you, if you schedule it in the morning, um, then you have, and you can't do it for some reason, you have the rest of the day to make it up. Whereas if you plan it for later and something comes up, you, you might not get it done. Um, so uh, ideally an hour at a time uh, in early in the morning, um, but you're not gonna use a stopwatch. You're not gonna do that anymore. Um, rather than using a stopwatch and working with time, it's better to uh, work with space or with quantity. And I'll define those further. By space, I mean, you're gonna say, I'm going to write a full page every day or half a page. I'm going to put several languages on, on a page and I'm going to divide it into four parts. So I'm going to fill a set portion of the page. So that should be the target that you have. Or with quantity, it refers back to the original text that you're looking at. Uh, you can say, I'm going to transcribe this whole paragraph or this whole page or something along those lines. So um, it's better to work with that than, um, than by, by pushing yourself with timing. Um, for polyliteracy, what should you be copying? What should be, you be transcribing? What should you be making a copy of for yourself? You should be using a significant work of, of spirituality or literature or philosophy, uh, something that has real cultural significance for the language that you're using. You should be making your own manuscript, just like a medieval monk would make a manuscript. You should be making your own manuscript of something that's very important to you. Um, we talked last time about how uh, by advanced shadowing you could come to narrate a work of, of great literary significance. Uh, personally do that. Um, you can use the same work that you're doing if you are lucky enough to find a recording, be able to make a recording of it. Um, it's also very satisfying if you're working on one text for narration and one text for uh, transcription and, and making your own um, book of it, making your own manuscript, uh, either way. Um, I would encourage you, though, uh, to think of creating something beautiful. Try to make a work of art where you're at it. Think of all the, 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 the medieval manuscripts that you might see in museums. They're all beautiful creations. If you're going to take the time to write something out that's important and valuable, um, make it beautiful. Try to improve your handwriting. Develop cal calligraphic skills. Put in illustrations or illuminations like in um, medieval Persian and Mughal manuscripts. Um, work towards making something beautiful while you're at it. Um, and for this purpose, I would say uh, that you can, we moderns have an idea that each book should be separate. Um, you could have a separate book for each work that you're doing. I'm presuming polyliterate, you're going to be doing several languages at a time, several different languages, several different works. Um, so you could have a separate book for each of them, or you could combine them. Uh, into one, uh, one, one volume, one fantastic page. Uh, just imagine that at some point in the future, somebody will find this book and wonder if it's a Voynich manuscript-like thing that has all sorts of different significance in it. Uh, think of the incident in, in, in The Name of the Rose when um, William of Baskerville smacks himself in the head because he didn't realize when Atsu was reading the poison book and he said it was in Arabic that there was only one portion that was in Arabic. The manuscript had many different languages in it. So um, think about possibly creating one fantastic volume along those lines. 
So that uh, concludes what I have to say to you for today. I like the format that's developing, whereby I will do my best to uh, produce a substantive video early in the week, ideally Tuesday uh, afternoons. I'll put it out if I have technical difficulties. It might wait till Wednesday. Um, and then I will collect the uh, substantive comments and questions that come in about it. And on Saturday, I will do a follow-up um, video to answer those questions. And the topics of my videos are uh, like this one here was suggested today by people who are interested in my experience and my approach to language learning. And so I'll look at the uh, comments as they come in and see what kind of things are being requested and do my best to make the videos that are of most, interested, most interest to those of you who are interested in what I have to say. Thank you for listening and goodbye.